Craig Kaplan from Texas A&M is going to tell us about his lab's uh, recent progress in thinking about PAL2 and transcriptional start. Okay. Let's just make sure this works. Okay, pretty good. All right, um, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, my uh, acknowledgments to the organizers for allowing me to present our work to you and for their um, attempts to ice me before this talk with abuse from um, a certain University of Pittsburgh faculty member. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so today I'm going to tell you about our studies um, on RNA polymerase II um, in transcription initiation. And the title of my talk is Paul II in the Shooting Gallery. And I'll tell you in a little bit what we mean by the shooting gallery. But the major goal of our studies are to think about the molecular biology of the initiation process and how um, uh, evolution might shape uh, the efficiency of this process at different promoters. We're not going to quite get there by the end, but I'm going to tell you about our progress to, uh, towards that goal. Okay. So today I'm going to tell you uh, mostly about the work from uh, a former graduate student in the lab, Huyen Jin, and um, Ting Ting Zhao. Ting Ting has a poster here today. It's sort of at the end of the yeast because it was in the wrong place. She was with population genetics. So you can't find her in the abstract, but I encourage you to go uh, look for her poster. It's kind of like a scavenger hunt. Okay. So in PUL2 initiation, we've got core promoter sequences that are going to recruit uh, DNA um, binding activators. Activators are going to recruit um, hundreds of other factors, probably at every single promoter. Now, these guys are going to work with general factors that are rec going to recognize core promoter elements. And the whole job of these guys all together is to get PUL2 to show up at the promoter, at the transcription start site. So a lot of times when people think about the mechanism of initiation, they think about initiation is going to be controlled by the uh, the power or the strength of the activators and the co-activators, and then PUL2 is just going to get recruited and it's going to go. And so what we focus on is the events that happen downstream of the activators and the co-activators. We're trying to understand exactly how this process works and how it's controlled. So you're going to recognize a start site, and some start sites, you know, they'll have some DNA elements associated with the start site, but the simplest version of the element that's associated with the start site and this is 80 to 90 percent of all um, five prime ends in RNAs for most eukaryotes are going to have this motif. It's a pyrimidine at minus one and a purine at the actual initiating nucleotide uh, for the start site. Now, there's a biochemical reason for this preference, but I'm not going to have time to go into it today. Okay. Now, the other thing that's important to know about uh, yeast promoters is that where are you going to initiate? And in fact, most, and of course, the level of initiation is going to be quite important. But most eukaryotic promoters, probably 80 to 90 percent, utilize multiple start sites during initiation. So you actually have a process that's either promiscuous or it's going to identify multiple start sites. So what our lab is trying to understand is why do you recognize one start site more than another? And what are the mechanisms that allow you to generate multiple start sites at any given promoter? Now, the reason why this might be interesting is that if you have multiple start sites for any particular gene, you're going to have um, some diversity in your transcripts. So you're going to have diversity in your UTR lengths, and you can probably have diversity in the function of those different RNAs. And if you have a lowly expressed gene, this means in different cells, you may have actually different populations of RNAs. They're going to be established by the probability of you using any of these particular start sites. Okay? So, Initiation, the, the biochemical efficiency of initiation is going to shape expression levels, but by what mechanism? So we're going to talk about a little bit that today. Okay? So our, the shooting gallery model um, for initiation is, is, is what we term the model which is called PUL2 scanning. So PUL2 is going to scan for the start site in directional fashion. Now, the scanning mechanism was originally proposed, it's a really cool paper from quite a while ago from John Liss's lab, 
And there's a lot of um, uh, genetics on start site selection from Hampsey and Ponticelli labs that um, have established the idea that uh, mutants that affect start site selection sort of have polar effects on which start sites are being affected, either upstream shifts or downstream shifts. And a beautiful paper by Jason Kuhner and David Brow, and Jason Kuhner is here. He, this was when he was a graduate student, but you should um, talk to him about his current work and his poster. This is a beautiful JBC paper that really strongly established that uh, the mechanism of initiation in Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a polar scanning mechanism where polymerase will see the upstream starts first, and then it will see the downstream starts, okay? And there's some biochemical work from Steve Hahn's lab that supports this, and then there's some genetic and molecular work Work from my lab. Okay, so in this model, you've got some general factors that are recognizing the Tata box. For example, if your promoter has a Tata box, they're going to TF2B and TBP, for example, they're going to recruit um, Paul2. And then you've got additional general factors such as TF2F that will be recruited. And then there's a critical factor, TF2H, which has uh, approximately 10 subunits. It's almost the size of Paul2 itself. And one subunit I need to point out to you that's the critical subunit of TF2H is the SSL2 protein. This is the yeast homologue of the X human XPB, okay? So TF2H is involved in nucleotide excision repair and transcription initiation. So SSL2 is an enzyme. It's a DNA-dependent ATPase that has DNA um, translocase activity. And this is the activity that's critical for both opening the promoter and in yeast, it's probably critical to do the actual scanning, okay? So TF2H is recruited, and using its DNA-dependent translocation, translocase activity, it pulls downstream DNA, or it pumps downstream DNA into, towards the polymerase. And the torsional strain of this pumping causes the two strands to open up. Now this is a, this, this open complex formation is a critical event because for polymerase to initiate transcription, it has to be able to see the template strand. So the non-template and template strands have to be unwound and you've got to have access to the template, okay? Now it turns out in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the start site is not in this um, initially unwound region. The start sites are downstream of that region. And the model is that TF2H continues. So the shooting gallery model that we have is that we can imagine that the Pol2 active site, which is the star, that the job of that active site is it's trying to take the first two nucleotides, it's trying to put them together. It's trying to synthesize phosphodiester bonds, okay? So we imagine that the Pol2 active site, which is fixed in position because it's bound to all these other GTFs, which are holding it at the promoter, that's like um, a gun in a shooting gallery. Not this kind of shooting gallery, a one where you can only shoot straight ahead. And the targets are going to move past the active site. So TF2H is going to translocate the targets, and they're going to come past the active site. Okay? So this is why we call it a shooting gallery model. Now, the critical prediction of the shooting gallery model is that the distributions of initiation sites are going to be controlled by both the biochemical rate of the Pol2 active site doing catalysis, and it's going to be controlled by the enzymatic properties of TF2H, because TF2H is controlling how the template goes past the active site, and RNA polymerase itself is controlling how, um, how fast or slow catalysis of that first phosphodiester bond is. Okay? So, what we did is we took, we took Pol2 activity, we, we took, made mutants in RNA polymerase II active site, either fast mutants or slow mutants, and we looked at the five prime ends of all RNAs across the genome, okay? And we looked at about 6,000 promoters, and they're sort of lined up on the y-axis here, and we looked at about uh, 400 bases of promoter DNA, and we aligned every promoter um, at this plus one position based on the major start site, okay? So what we did is we subtracted the distribution of wild-type transcription start site usage from our fast polymerase mutant. That polymerase mutant is more active. And in orange, that's every start site where we saw a relative increase in activity or a relative increase in usage or initiation. And in cyan, we saw a relative decrease. So we can see at every single promoter in yeast 
our fast polymerase means shift start sites upstream. Okay? So you gain upstream start sites and you lose downstream start sites. Now this is exactly what you would expect. If you're more active, you're more likely to hit the target. So if TF2H is pumping the target past the active site, but the active site is more active, it's going to hit the target earlier, which means you're going to initiate more upstream than downstream. Now in our slow mutant right here, we see the opposite effect. Start site usage lifts, ships downstream because the PAL2 active site is slower than usual. So more DNA will go past the active site by the time that you initiate. Okay? So that fits with the model. So the shooting gallery model, as I told you, it, it predicts that TF2H means should also alter t uh, TSS distributions. So to look at this, we've utilized some very simple phenotypes to try to select for initiation means of uh, TF2H subunits. Okay? So we took advantage of the IMD2 gene in yeast. So normally as it initiates, it has an unproductive upstream start site. Okay? So in the absence of any other stimulus, this is not a functional RNA. If you give yeast a drug called MPA, you now use this downstream start site and you have a functional gene product. Well, it turns out this gene product is required for the yeast to be resistant to the treatment that induces the gene. So what happens is that mutants that shift start sites upstream cannot make this switch. Those mutants are sensitive to MPA. We have a really high correlation with the number of mutants that are MPA sensitive that show initiation defects. So this phenotype is very useful to select for upstream shifting mutants. Now, we ha also have another reporter where we use the IMD2 promoter. In this case, we fuse it to HIS3. It turns out our downstream shifting mutants constitutively express this reporter. So in the absence of any MPA, we have a HIS plus phenotype. So we're taking the same promoter and we're using it two different ways to select for upstream and downstream shifting mutants. So Ting Ting in the lab, um, I'm going to sh just show you the controls here. So here's a bunch of Pol2 mutants. Some are slow and they're HIS plus with this reporter. Some are fast and they're MPA sensitive. Now I'm going to point out they have this other phenotype which I don't have time to tell you about. This is called the SPT phenotype, but they're lice plus in our particular strain. Now this is going to be important because I'm going to show you that our TF2H means are different. So Ting Ting selected to the genetic screen using PCR immunogenesis, and she got about three classes of mutants. And these are just an, some examples of what she pulled out. The first class, first two classes, really strongly HIS plus, but only one of them has the SPT phenotype. But she also got a lot of MPA sensitives. So we would predict that either of these classes are affecting um, uh, transcription start sites. These we predict are downstream shifters, and these are upstream shifters. But I want to point out to you that in Paul 2 situation, MPA and SPT correlate with each other. In the SSL2 situation, SPT mutants do not correlate with MPA. In fact, they correlate with the HES plus mutants. So we've got something different going on. Okay? And the other very, very interesting thing is we've got substitutions in the same residue that have opposite phenotypes. So we think this is a critical domain to regulate TF2H activity during initiation because you don't normally get that. You don't normally expect to see the same uh, residue mutated to different substitutions that give opposite phenotypes. But what I want to show you as I wrap up the end of the talk, I want to show you that the, the nature, and Ting Ting has looked at a number of these mutants by um, primer extension, and they actually all do affect start sites at our reporter gene ADH1. So we selected them for phenotypes at IMD2, and we look at ADH1, and they affect start sites. So every known upstream shifting mutant, whether it be in PAL2 or other factors that are known to shift start sites upstream, show this very specific um, molecular phenotype at ADH1. They enable you to use upstream start sites that you never see in the wild type, or you see very, very lowly in the wild type. An SSL2 upstream shifter, for example, this um, previously published allele of SSL2, this was first shown by the Hampsey lab, it strongly shifts start sites upstream, but it doesn't give you any of these new sites. So on the next slide, I'm going to give you our model for what types of uh, mutations these guys are. So how does TF2 activity contribute to PAL2 initiation? First of all, in the genome, you have many possible initiators. 
you're not going to use them because you don't have a promoter. However, if you do have a promoter, you have particular locations that you're going to use. Now what we know in yeast is that if your start site is too close to your core promoter element, you're not going to use it. So there's some conserved distance constraint that we don't know what, how it's operating. However, you don't use start sites forever. So why is it that you don't use start sites forever? Well, one simple model is that you run out of polymerase because all of your polymerase is initiated. Okay? The other model, though, is that TF2H, which is the enzyme, it has a certain processivity. It can only scan so far. However, if you have mutations that affect the processivity of TF2H, what they'll do is if you have a mutant of TF2H that can't scan as far, it's going to start affecting these downstream start sites and it's going to truncate them because polymerase will never get to them because TF2H cannot scan that far. However, these sites will not be affected because TF2H is not affecting the efficiency of initiation, it's only affecting the processivity. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the work of Huyan Jin and Ting Ting Zhao, who um, did the work I showed you. Bryce Nichols at Rutgers did the sequencing with us. Um, I want to point out that three students are here. Chen Si has a poster, Ting Ting has a poster, and Yun is around, so please talk to them. Um, and thank you so much. I'll take questions. Um, so how does the amount of DNA that you're typically seeing scanned uh, for initiation sites compared to the amount of DNA unwound for nucleotide excision, or yeah, nucleotide excision repair? Um, the scanning is a lot more. So the, first of all, the start sites in yeast are approximately 40 to 120 bases downstream of, say, the Tata box. That means you're going to scan at least maybe 20 to 120. There are single molecule studies from the Block and the Kornberg lab that look at what appears to be scanning in the single molecule system. And then the average processivity of TF2H in that assay is about 95 bases. The average position of a start site downstream from a Tata is 85 bases in yeast. So you really have evolved for some promoters to have the start sites right in that window of scanning length. But other promoters, the start site is way down on the end and you would predict that those promoters should be very, very inefficient. And if you move the start site closer to the Tata box, you actually would predict that expression would go up. And a follow up on that, do you think, uh, can you speculate if that's a sort of final check for, to prevent spurious transcription? Um, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, just that you really need the whole, everything assembled properly to get to that almost maximum processivity length where you have that real initiation. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't know why you would want to go that far, but for yeast, you, you need to sort of go that far. The other interesting thing that didn't come out in the talk is that TF2H has to take DNA from somewhere to pump it to polymerase to scan. So there's going to be interactions between TF2H and likely the plus one nucleosome that also could end up being regulatory for the expression of a particular promoter. It, I decided that rather than having the chair ask one more question, I would, uh, before we thank all of the speakers, end with the reminder that this evening's session that begins promptly, <clears throat> excuse me, at 7.45, is going to feature one of the highlights of the yeast segment of the meeting, which is the Ira Herskowitz Award Lecture, which will be given by Lars Steinmetz. So please be here at 7.45 for that uh, very important occasion, along with the session on tackling human disease using yeast. And with that, thanks to the audience for the great questions and for the speakers as well.